So today, surprise, we're going to be talking about orchard mason bees, the Osmia lignaria. And I have the, I want to teach you about them, but the first thing I want to ask you is how many of you have blueberries, fruit trees, cane berries? If you raise your hand. Okay. Mason bees are really cool because they're native. But the other really cool thing is they are incredible pollinators. So I want to teach you about why you would want to maybe raise them on your own property. So we're going to learn to identify mason bees, understand the difference between mason bees and honey bees, learn how to attract mason bees, know the life cycle, and then be aware of possible pest problems so that you can care for them, keep them healthy, and have more mason bees next year. And I went backwards. There we go. <laughs> okay, so the orchard mason bee, the one pictured on the slide, is a native to North America. Um, they're very um, populous here in the Oregon area, Portland. They are an early season pollinator. They're gonna come out way earlier than most any other bees. They're very gentle. They don't sting. They're really fun to just hang around with. Um, they're small. They look, as you can see, they look a lot like a fly. So before you swat anything, make sure it's not a mason bee, okay? Um, there's a solitary bee. There are no queens. There are female bees, but there's not a queen that everybody kind of takes care of. They all do their own thing. And they're active mid-March to mid-May. Here in Portland, we have another mason bee that's called the horn face bee, Osmia cornifrons. It's uh, brought in from Japan. And they did it on purpose because it's a really great pollinator. But they've kind of come in and mixed up with our, our native bees. But they cohabit really nicely. And so it's kind of okay, but the first time I had my, I thought all my blue orchard mason bees and the first thing that popped out was a horn face bee. And I went, what the heck is that? You know? So I found out about it and it's okay. So if you've got some mason bees and you see that, take a deep breath, it's all good. They're really great pollinators as well. Mason bees versus honey bees. Mason bees are active at lower temperatures, so they'll fly around 55 degrees. Honey bees like it warmer, you know, 57, 59, 60. Um, mason bees will fly in the light rain. Honey bees do not. They're going, nope, raining, not gonna happen. Mason bees are early risers. They start very early in the morning. They work late at night. They stick close to home. They only go like 300 feet. A honeybee will travel miles. And it takes fewer mason bees to pollinate a fruit tree. Now, if you had two employees and one was a mason bee and one was a honeybee, your mason bee is gonna get employee of the century because it's working <laughs> so much harder. So if you have a fruit tree Again, almonds, nuts, uh, apples, pears. It will take seven mason bees to pollinate and it would take 354 honeybees to do the same amount of work. The reason being is the way they work. Honeybees are very precise. They have little pollen baskets, nectar baskets, on the back legs and so they go into a flower and they look for the nectar and they take it out and they put it away and then they go to the next flower and they're very organized kind of like my little sister <laughs> the mason bees kind of go there they have hair all over their body so it collects the pollen they go into flower 
And they just like, oh, yeah. And so they get lots and lots of pollen. And then they're kind of also not really focused. So a honeybee will go, flower, flower, flower. And a mason bee will go, yeah, there's one over there. And so they're really, <laughs> they're very enthusiastic. And they're kind of messy. But it works. And so they get, they really do their job. Mason bee nesting habits. Naturally, they will be in like um, holes that have been bored by beetles or something like that. But they're really indiscriminate about what they will nest in. So they like uh, reeds, bamboo, things like that. Your house siding. Uh, <laughs> oh, there's a hole. I'll go in there. Um, we do get calls saying, I've got bees. You know, what kind of bee is in it? It's not going to ruin it. It'll just leave it. It'll be fine. The electrical plug. This is a picture from my daughter's house. Like, oh, that's the right size. We'll go in there. So they're really indiscriminate. But you can, if you want to raise mason bees, help them be healthy, there are things that are available readily available that make it easier to care for them and give them great places where they have to work less hard and find good homes. So the bee block is a wood laminate and that comes apart at the end of the year and then it's all filled with mason bee cocoons. Um, six inches long is the magic right now according to the research. Um, so you'll see some bee blocks, bee tubes that are four inches, and that's really not optimal for bees. So make sure it's like six inches or longer. The back of the block needs to be covered so it's dark, so that it, and this is what it looks like in nature. I'm going into a beetle hole. It's dark in the back. We also have craft tubes, the brown, with inserts. And these make it really easy to harvest your bees and clean them at the end of the year if you're going to do that. Uh, the back of the tubes have to be, the back of the craft tubes need to be closed again so it's dark. And then you can get two kinds of inserts. One is the paper, and one you kind of have to unravel it because it's in a spiral. The ones I like are the ones that are pre split down the middle. And you can see here. Um, on the right, how it just opens up. This is also a really good description because you can look at, at the top of the picture, notice how the cocoons are bigger, and then toward the bottom they get smaller. So when a female bee, mason bee, lays her eggs, when she starts a new tube, she lays, lays the female eggs in the back of the tube, and she can choose which one it's going to be. So she lays several of those, and then at the front of the tube, she will lay the male eggs. So they're the ones that come out first. Here's some examples of mason bee nest boxes. Um, you can see we've got a mixture of the tubes, we've got um, the laminate, and then the one in the middle is. Um, Hang on. We're supposed to have a lovely picture of the bees flying in and out, but it's not working. So you can drill holes in, a, in blocks, but if you want to take care of the bees, it's best to put a tube insert in so that at the end of the season, you can pull those tubes out. Uh, PVC pipe, even something simple like that. People love to have really cute houses. I love really cute houses. The bees don't care. Um, and then a, you can see a couple of pictures here of emergent boxes. Um, the little yellow thing uh, at the, uh, on the actual house, that's an emergent box. We'll talk a little bit more about that later. There we go. So here are the emergent boxes. And I've used uh, multiple things. Uh, the yellow one is an old box of 35 millimeter slides, a uh, business card box, a big um, medicine bottle. 
getting more and more of those as I get older, um, but they're free. And then this year I'm using uh, cardboard tubes that I've drilled the, hole, the proper hole in. And so what you want to do is not stuff the whole box, the emergent box, with cocoons, but you want to keep it so that there's plenty of room. You don't want to you know, get them all crowded. So leave, just keep them about half full. Um, if you've got an airtight container, it's good to drill small holes so that they can breathe. And then keep them out of the rain if, after you've already put them out. Right now, I've got most of mine filled. They're waiting in the refrigerator until the weather decides to finally cooperate. But, so they're protected until they go out. Who has seen the really cute bee houses at Costco? Anybody? OK. Adorable. I bought one the first year myself. But they're not really recommended for mason bees. Number one, um, you can't get them out. All, the, all of the things are glued in. They're not protected enough from the rain, so they get really, really moldy. It's just a perfect storm for mold, parasites, fungi, just nasty stuff because you can't clean it in. But it's cute, you know. Um, some people think, oh, plastic straws, that's the right size. And it is about the right size, but they don't breathe. And so if the bees go in and lay their eggs there, the cocoons are going to suffocate. Uh, to attract mason bees. So even if you just like put some out, or even, even if you just put out some tubes and a nest, native mason bees might come even if you don't populate it yourself. But you want to have pollen flowers within 300 feet. Again, they don't go very far. Um, they're hard workers, but only in your yard. They prefer things like dandelions, fruit blossoms, like, OK, this is, again, if you saw the talk, easy, easy, to, easy to get. You know, it's not hard work to get the pollen. They're also attracted to blossoms like blueberry and Andromeda bush or pieris. So they're really good pollinators of blueberries. They are not discriminate again. They'll nest anywhere. They'll get pollen from any flower. So it's kind of like, OK, what have we got? Mud. This is a really important thing with mason bees because that's what they use to wall off each egg of their nest. So it needs to be readily available. And you know, everybody says mulch, 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 mulch. Well, if you've got mason bees around, you need an area, hopefully close to the nest, where you pull away the mulch and have moist native soil. Clay is best um, so that they can they can use that to wall off each egg as they lay it. And think about it. If you have something, well, oh, it's on the other side of the yard, that's fine. But if it's within 20 feet of the nest, you don't have this poor queen bee going, OK, time to wall off the nest. <sighs> Grab it, drag it back. So make it easy for them. Keep it close, and they'll be happy. If you don't have the proper kind of mud, you can always do a pan and put um, like a liter bottle or something with a little hole in it to keep it wet. We just did an installation at Blue Lake Park where we did this um, last week. So it's like, OK, they, they just didn't have quite of the right soil, so we, we made it happen. OK, so here's the life cycle. Here what, here's what happens. They emerge from the nest early in spring, males first. Right about now is when things are happening. Mating occurs after the females come out, obviously. And then the males die. They're done. So anything you see after like three weeks, it's going to be a female. Three to four days after nesting, mating, she begins nesting and putting, she, again, she starts with the female bees at the back of the tube or the cavity, and then 
She does male bees toward the front. She lays an egg, she places a mud plug, and then gathers more, more pollen, lays an egg, does the mud plug, and so this goes on and on for several weeks. Um, she can collect pollen and nectar from 15 to 20 loads of flowers, and then she's ready to go. So when she has enough pollen and nectar, she lays the egg, and you can see in the tube where she's got, there's a pollen uh, plug, or sorry, pollen bundle, pollen and nectar. She's laid the egg in there, she's walled it off, she's starting the next one. And that just goes in a six inch tube, you can usually get six to eight cocoons. The eggs hatch within just a few days and they start eating all of that food that mom brought for them for about 10 days and then they spin a cocoon. They pupate within that cocoon and throughout the summer, they become adult bees. And that's how they remain in the cocoon all winter long until the next spring when it's time to come out again. So here's a year in the life of a mason bee and if you're taking care of it, kind of the time to do things. So March, it's time to emerge. This is happening now. April, May, they're busy procreating, doing their thing. In June, you wanna take the mason bees, if you've got them in um, a place where you can take them out, take the blocks or take the tubes, put them in a paper bag or something protected and leave them in your garage. This will help keep uh, parasites from going into the nesting sites. July through August, they're busy doing their thing. You don't pay attention to them at all. September through February, bees are dormant in the cocoon, and that's when you clean them. We'll go a little bit more into that. Put them in the refrigerator so they stay dormant. And then next March, the whole thing starts over again. Parasites, now these are the things that can get in and this is why I really recommend that you clean your cocoons every year. September, October, 1st of November. The Crombian mites, also known as hairy footed mites, they will come into the nesting tube and they will eat the pollen and they'll do their um, basically kill the larva so there's nothing there for him, for him to eat. And then as the bees emerge, if they're left in the tube with the chromium mite parasite in there, they jump on the bees as they emerge. And if you can see on the bottom here, that is a bee covered with chromium mites. And it can get so heavy that they can't fly anymore. And they will go down on the ground and they're bird food. So that's one of the reasons that you want to clean it so that you can keep that mite population controlled. Chalcid wasps, again, they're tiny. You can see we've got a grain of rice down at the bottom right hand compared to the chalcid wasps, really, really tiny. And they come in and they drill a hole through the, the tube and they will lay their egg in the cocoon and then the wasp eats the egg or the cocoon. Chalk root is a new thing for uh, mason bees, new issue that we're having. It's a big problem with honeybees. It gets in a nest and, or a hive and kind of wipes them out. We're seeing it more and more with mason bees now. And chalk root is a fungus. So these little C-shaped things that you, you're seeing, that is basically uh, a larva that has been infected with chalk brood. And it basically makes it like a mummy. But when that chalk brood is touched, it kind of again explodes and it gets all over the bees. And then it goes, as they're going from the tube or wherever, it infects, it gets on the bees. And then as they lay new eggs, we get more chalk brood. 
So again, that's something that you kind of want to be on top of, and they're really easy to see when you take the eggs out, or the cocoons out, sorry, um, because they look like that. And you go, okay, that's not right. So you want to take those, handle them carefully, remove them, throw them in the trash, not in the garden, and then just keep that area clean. This is the fun part. So you remove the bees um, from the cocoons and you wash them. And people are going, what? So you put them in a mixture of bleach and water. The reason you use the bleach is because the cocoons are made of silk. And so the little bit of bleach will dissolve that just very first layer of cocoons of the cocoon. And that gets rid of any mites, any nasty things that are there. And then you rinse it off with water, get them nice and cool and clean. Keep it cool. You're always going to use cold water. Um, and then you dry them very, very thoroughly. And then again, you can put them in a container, put them in the refrigerator. They're good to go. This is what they look like after they're clean. If you're not cleaning your bees and you're just letting them do sort of the same thing every year, at the beginning of the year, take a little blue, uh, any color actually, uh, marker and mark the, mark the uh, mud plug. So after a few weeks, the ones that are left, those are not viable. And you know you can take those out. Here's females filling a nest. This month, if you don't have bees, you can get some. You can purchase them. You can sweet talk a friend who has extra cocoons. Hey, I started with 13. This year I had 18,000 cocoons. Oh. Now I bought some of those, but. <laughs> Um, set out nest, nest, uh, nest boxes with nesting materials and then place the cocoons next to the mess, nesting materials so that when they come out, they're going, oh, this is a great place to live. I'm happy here, okay? Um, when, and that's what everybody's asking, when. Last week, we had those gorgeous days and I'm going, oh, this would be perfect. And then I looked and I'm going, okay, Friday's gonna just suck. And if you put them out too early, like the males will come out. And last year I looked at this, the males came out and then we had weather like we had yesterday. And I thought, well, what's going on? So I took the emergent box and I looked in and they had all gone back into the emergent box. They're going, <laughs> <laughs> but you know, they don't have a lot of fat storage. So you want to make it as optimal as you can, having the right things in bloom, the right temperatures, I'm putting mine out this week. If you don't have, I've kept them in the refrigerator too long and they will hatch in the refrigerator. It's like, okay, it's time. So that's what you know. Okay, so take your cocoons out of storage. If you have them, get them, put them in their boxes, make them all nice and happy and watch the fun begin. That's the end. Mm -hmm.